Powered by GoGoat Sports in partnership with TSN, it is episode 35, season four of the Rain Rigs Hockey Podcast. And as always, we are presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. You know, so often, Ray Ferraro, um, you know, you, you enjoy the moments, especially when, when celebrated players come back into a city, maybe they started their career and played for a long time, won a Stanley Cup, whatever. So Johnny Goodrow back in Calgary to take on the Flames, um, a game that you guys did on ESPN. And I don't know if I'm surprised by the showering of booze or not. I'm I'm of the opinion, you buy a ticket. I don't like when guys throw their, their sweaters on the ice. I think that's disrespectful to any team, any player, any organization. Um, but if you want to have some fun, entertain yourself, and boo Johnny Goudreau every time he touches the puck in Calgary, fill your boots. I got no problem with that. And I think you correct me if I'm wrong because you were there. He handled it pretty well, both pregame and postgame. He had an incredible night. Um, I'm sure it was really weird and odd. And, you know, he uh, they put a video to get, you know, the video that they put for the returning players. Um, as soon as they put his face up on the board, the building started to boo. <laughs> then they cheered really loudly through the video. Yeah. And then Johnny stood up and waved and he was, you could, you know, I mean, he was three feet from me. He had, it was really emotion in his face. And then the video ended. They cheered him through all that. They cheered him when he waved and thanked the fans. And then it stopped and they returned immediately to booing him, like <laughs> in the same breath. I love it. So I, I thought um, their commitment to the booing was really, uh, was really notable. I mean, man, that went to overtime and they were booing him still in overtime. So he had two beautiful assists, terrific passes. He hit a goal post. He missed a penalty shot. He hit Dan Vladar in the head twice with a slapper. Like he, he honestly could have had four goals last night it, it, and then Calgary won in overtime. So I, I think the people went home feeling like, oh, that was a great night. And, and I hope Goudreau did too, because he was terrific. He was all over the game. It's for the people throwing their jerseys on the ice. I don't even mind that. And this is why. If you spend three hundred dollars on a jersey, and you're dumb enough or angry enough to throw it onto the ice, it's just like walking out in the street and throwing three hundred bucks into the middle of the street. If you want to do that, <laughs> knock yourself out. I re I really don't care. I, is it disrespectful to the team you're supposed to be a fan of? Sure, but again, you that guy. Just think that guy or girl. She's paid a couple hundred bucks to get in the building to throw yeah. a three hundred dollars sweater on the ice. Yeah. So if, if the 500 bucks doesn't matter to you, toss it. You'll realize it later. Jeez, I just wasted 500. I think you should have decoys, right? Right? Like, so don't throw the $300 one. Have like a, a t-shirt or something on underneath. It's like the hat trick cap, right? Like I didn't pay $55 for a, a team logoed hat to throw on the ice in a moment of euphoria because one of my favorite players just got the hat trick I have a like a crappy one stashed in a pocket or something and then lob that into well, the into the fray well that take the planning of that i, know, I, I know, mean I come know. on like you, <laughs> so i i got a hat trick in atlanta and they brought they collected all the hats and so they bring this this bring this big collection in a gigantic garbage bag I don't know. There had to be a hundred hats in there or something. I don't know. Something like that. So I was looking through them. Some of them you wouldn't have put on tiny. Like they were just so dirty. gritty. Gritty. Oh, oh yeah. Those oh, ones have on. seen lots of use. And I'm like, oh man, that's, <laughs> I don't even want to touch the brim on this one. Yeah. I always wondered what they did with the hats. I just assumed that they went to charity, right? Like the, the clean ones and the, the ugly ones just went where they should go into the garbage. Well, I hope they Why? do. You got the bag? Yeah, I hope. Well, they gave it to me. I didn't take it with me. What, am I going to take 100 hats home? <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's, that's hey, kids, pick out a hat. Not this yeah. one here. It's a little greasy. This one's okay. <laughs> 
he should have taken it to like a doctor's office and see if there's any infestations and things like that. <laughs> oh, I uh, I left it right where it was. What a way to start episode 35. <clears throat> All right, headlines again presented this season by our uh, good friends at Boston Pizza and. Oh, there's a number of ways we could attack the goings on in Vancouver. <coughs> Excuse me, choking me up. Uh, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. For reasons that I don't entirely understand, and I feel like I was pretty invested in the telling of, of the foibles of the Vancouver Canucks over the last several months here. Um, but I don't entirely understand why the Canucks waited until Sunday morning to fire Bruce Boudreau. But the hockey world clearly was in tune, focused, very passionate, certainly the fan base in Vancouver, maybe even fixated right on this for weeks. So in-season changes seldom go well, right? Now, they, the, the club may improve. I mean, you may get a bump as the Vancouver Canucks got. They called it the Boudreaux bump when he replaced Travis Green. But Bruce's popularity with the fans and the media complicated this situation Maybe in tow with the fact that, look, Canucks management ownership had their reasons, whatever they are, and, and Rutherford and, and Patrick Alvin tried to articulate some, probably not all, but they had their reasons for waiting as long as they did. And then you throw in the popularity of, of Boudreaux um, almost globally, right? Because he's that guy. He's viewed as a nice guy. And this turned into a bit of a cesspool, in all fairness. Um, and a troubling one across across the board. So I don't know how you feel, but you, you have a unique perspective on this. And I'm sure you're as happy as anyone associated with the organization or even as a fan. Okay, it's over. Now let's let's do whatever we can to move forward. Well, I'm I mean, I'm sure most people listening or almost all people listening know that my wife works in the management group. So you know, my perspective is a, you know, is probably a little more closely tied right. um, and respectful of, of her position. I will say this, though. I, there's a couple of things that um, I don't think people understand. N number one is um, most of us, or, well, I, I can't think of anybody that doesn't think that when they knew that it was going in this direction, it should have been moved quicker. Mm -hmm. Like it, it just should have been moved quicker. They, if they had decided that they, they were going to go down this road and the story got out in the volume that it did, even if you didn't want to, you probably had to, but we don't know the reasons and won't know the reasons why that occurred. So that's the first part. The, the second part is, it was also reported that, you know, uh, well, actually, Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvine said they had been talking to people uh, over the last month or so. They first reached out. I think the timeline was yeah. a month ago or so to Rick Tockett. If people don't think this happens, they're completely naive. When you're thinking of making a coaching change, you don't just sit there, make the change this morning and go, now we're going to start to look. Mm -hmm. You might end up at that point that, yeah, we're going to make a change. There's nobody out there that we're really interested in at this point. So we will put an interim coach in place. That that would be the way that happens. But Bruce did an article with um, with his buddy, Mike Russo in, in Minnesota and he said in the article, he was watching the game in Anaheim from a hotel when Randy Carlisle got fired after the game. And it's, that's, not, that's not a, um, a kick in the shins to Bruce. That's the way that it works. If, if, they, if they want the next coach and Bruce was available, Anaheim agreed to a deal. They had to, they had to sign some stuff and papers and talk to Washington. and all that stuff. And then Carlisle's coaching, he probably knew at that time something was going to happen and he gets fired and Bruce comes in the next day. So I, I thought, honestly, I thought Bruce did the best he could with was a crappy spot. It really was. I wish it would have been cleaner. 
I think a lot of people wish it would have been quicker and cleaner. Um, but that's, you know, that was explained as best as possible or as best as they wanted to explain it. And, you know, Bruce is going to do the interviews he's going to do and explain what he's going to explain. And mm-hmm. like I, I heard his interview yesterday and he was, you know, with, with Mike, who's a terrific reporter. And yeah. he's like, look, I'm not going to talk about what happened. I'm not going to throw stones anywhere. Like he, he walks away and he'll, we'll see Bruce on TV near us soon. I mean, whether, wherever yeah. it's going to be, whomever it's going to be with, he will stay in the game he loves. Mm-hmm. Well, again, we'll, we'll, I want your thoughts on talk it on foot on Gonchar and and what you see moving forward as a coaching staff there. Um, but one more on on Boudreau because the article that I read this morning, NHL.com, you know, he identifies goaltending in this piece as their biggest issue, and and you know says, look, Thatcher Demko, um, in his own recollection, would say that early on he struggled. And then he got hurt. And and Bruce isn't wrong. You know, normally when you see good teams and the coach is getting a ton of credit, well, there's a lot of things that factor into that. And, and almost always a higher level of goaltending is is part of that sure. formula. Yep. You know, so I, I think yeah, every, he's fair. And I think uh, he's, he's accurate in saying that. Wouldn't you agree? Y- yes, but... Last year, when they went on that run after Bruce was hired, Demko was stopping the puck, I think, 94% of the time. If that's the goaltending you need to win, then there's other problems, (laughs) right? Because because it's just not, it's not a sustainable number. I think Igor Shosturkin and Andre Vasilevsky are two of the very best. And Shosturkin was 93 and a half. 0.935 0.935 last year, and he's not yeah. this year because it's you just can't. It's too hard. Yeah. If I'm looking at that team, clearly Thatcher Demko's start and injury is not been a good thing. It their goaltending plummeted the quality to Spencer Martin and Colin Delia, but Spencer Martin was signed as a backup. Now you got to play all the time, and it it never works. It just right. it just doesn't. They're the way they defend is about personnel, which isn't good enough, and they know it's not, and they've, they're have they going to have to try and change it in the next eight weeks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, the second part is, man, they give up chances from dead center way too much. And some of that goes to the way they structure their D zone or don't structure it. And mm-hmm. so there, there's there's two sides to this. There's the... The human side, which I think everybody agrees should have been handled maybe a little cleaner, a little quicker. And then there's the hockey side, which from the red line back is a mess. Mm -hmm. And I think both are fair. So that's that's the part that he's got to wear a little bit. It can't always be somebody else's fault. All right. So when we when we look at the coaching staff, Rick Tockett, obviously a head coach, you've got Adam Foote, you've got Sergey Gonchar coming in. Uh, I know two of these three guys very, very well. I don't know Gonchar as well. Um, communication is never going to be an issue with this trio, um, but I'm not sure what to expect. Again, the low hanging fruit from some was to go after Tockett's coaching record to this point, you know, in his NHL head coaching career. Well, You know, I'm sure you'll support this. He didn't have a whole lot of help in Arizona and probably had less help in Tampa Bay when he was there because the Tampa Bay Lightning were going through some ownership issues, and that's putting it mildly. Um, So, I I mean, I'm curious to see how this all comes together, Um, you know, just based on on the personalities, right? But Tockett has had a long time to have his conversations with Gonchar, who you know well from the Pittsburgh days, um, likely Adam Foote as well. So he obviously feels a connection and a comfort level to bring those two guys along with him to try and, and get the retool started in Vancouver. Well, I'm, uh, for sure. I mean, what coach brings in a guy he doesn't know yeah. or doesn't feel comfortable with? I mean, it every coach that 
is allowed to pick his staff is going to go to people that he knows. Pete DeBoer has brought Steve Spot with him everywhere <laughs> they go. Yeah. You get one, you get the other. And that's because Pete's comfortable with Steve's knowledge and with Steve's support and knowing that his message is going to be supported. So I'm, I mean, I don't know this, but I'm just assuming that Rick Tockett has that comfort with Sergey Gonchar and Adam Foote. If, if people want um, a little bit of a window into what both Tockett and Foote are like, I don't even know how long ago he was the coach in Tampa, Rick. I mean, 15 years or 12 years, whatever it was, 12 years, I guess. Stamkos was just a kid, as I recall. And then Adam Foote um, uh, was on both. The point is both of them were, have been on our podcast. And so if you listen, go back in the archives, you'll get a little bit of a window in what those guys are like in their view of coaching. And both of them, I know you know them better than me, but I was surprised with both when we hung up about how much they talked about communication, yeah. about getting your message mm -hmm. clearly to the players. So I, I read an article on the report yesterday or reporting on the practice yesterday, the first one. And so they've got on the ice, there was Tockett, Gonchar, Foot, Jason King, and Mike Yo. Mm hmm. And Ian Clark, the goalie coach. But I never count the goalie coaches because they only talk to two players anyway. <laughs> then, and then with 15 minutes left in practice, the Sedins came on the ice for development work after practice with the players. So if you're wondering if there's going to be a staff that touches, touch points each of the players, that will, that will be the case. It was not the case prior. So this will be a different staff and a different approach. Will it make them better? I, d I don't know. I mean, they're still, still the same personnel that they've talked about not being good enough that gets them into the retool. And so until that personnel changes, you can only get so much better. I, I'll be shocked if they don't become a tighter team. Yeah. Like I'll be really yeah. surprised. Yeah. If they don't become a, a tighter defensive team. Yeah. Well, and look, we'll, we'll move on to Daryl Sutter and the Calgary Flames here momentarily. But I, I again, like the honesty from talking in his media availability, um, even to the point of, of openly discussing a conversation he quickly had with JT Miller and how JT Miller expressed to him, I, I know there are areas that I've got to get better in. And that's not just as a hockey player, you know, JT Miller owns his abrasiveness and, you know, the emotional side of, of his approach. And without saying so, that was my read from Tockett, <clears throat> but in a positive way, right? Like here's a guy I can work with because we can see that he's a hell of a hockey player, but he's also expressed there's some, some parts of, of how I approach the game, maybe how I deal with my teammates that definitely needs some polish. And, and he was asking for help. That was my mm. takeaway in that. Well, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, another difference between the two coaches are, you know, Bruce really supports the top end of his roster. Like Bruce yeah. is, a, yeah. this should not go, this should not go unnoticed. Like he is a really nice person, mm -hmm. Bruce. He doesn't want people to be upset. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to produce. He wants them to. Play the Jim. I don't know if you saw Jim or his first goal he scored on Jim Rutherford Jimmy. 50 yeah, I years saw ago. It. Yeah, yeah, and and Bruce it, just in that face they showed yeah. Bruce on the bench the joy. He loves the game. He wants his Pure players relation. to love the game. Yeah, and there's a the difference is that there'll be a different style of message for the players from talking. Mm -hmm. There'll be a, a harder edge to the accountability. Yeah. Um, that's just the way he is. And it's one's better, one's worse. Well, whatever. It's just one person to the next person. And the the one thing that will happen, I think, is you'll see, uh, well, this is now the third one thing I think will happen that I've said, but is that the minutes of the top guys are going to shrink. Yeah. And the pace 
of the game will try to increase because of that. That will be one of their goals, one of Tockett's goals. Yeah. I, I got to say, like, I'm done yeah. talking about the Canucks. I, I'm with you, bud. I'm, I'm with just you. done talking about I, but I'm Hell, I gotta forward. go home, Drakes, for cry for crying <laughs> out loud. More. I gotta go home. <laughs> no, and just try not to keep my foot in my mouth. Move on, <laughs> damn it. Move on. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move on to another touchy one. Um now in fairness, I, I don't know if you were there for it yesterday when Daryl Sutter, I mean, he basically walked back his post-game comments on Saturday night, right. which was perceived, and and this is how I perceived it to be borderline mockery of either Jacob Pelche making his NHL debut or the media for asking the veteran coach to assess Jacob's NHL debut. And the reason he walked it back was more in an explanation, right, of, look, it may have looked like I was mocking him, but because of how the game was played situationally, he didn't he didn't get as much time on the ice as he would have preferred, as I would have liked as his head coach. Therefore, I was literally just reading the stats off the sheet. Now, I'm you know, kind of expanding and, and, and putting words into maybe what the meaning of the walkback was from Daryl Sutter. However, in saying that, when he started by grabbing his glasses, as we've all seen now the infamous clip, and asking what number is Jacob Pelsey. Like, right. I'll tell you what, Ray, and, and I think you and I talked about this on the phone uh, yesterday, whenever it was, day before. Um, but as a hockey father, okay, when your kid is playing in the NHL, as a dad, you don't have an opinion that matters, right? You might you might with your wife or at no. home, but in the bigger picture, your opinion as a hockey parent doesn't matter. That would have pissed me off as a hockey dad. My kid's got this one time to enjoy the moment, which is his first NHL regular season game. And a veteran head coach just steps on him like an ant. So anyway, that was my take. What would you think? Yeah, I, I, I certainly, I certainly wasn't a fan of the way he went about. You know, six minutes and forty nine seconds, no points, one shot, eleven seconds on the power play or whatever. You know, he went, he went left to right on the on the stat sheet, and then he said, "Man, it's a tough league. He's twenty one years old. Tough league." That could have been answered in a hundred different ways. One way being, hey, look, there was a bunch of penalties tonight. He didn't get on the ice very much. I was really happy for him. He had the one good chance. And, man, there's a, there's a long yeah. road to being a regular player, but uh, he took the first step tonight. So, yeah. so what's wrong with saying that? So in saying that, he did. Daryl did explain a little bit more fully with the number of penalties uh, that there was yeah. in the Tampa game. So we had a great chance in the Tampa game that um, Vasilevsky made a really good stop. Last night, he had a chance in the second period. Jonas Corposalo made an unbelievable <laughs> save. One of those ones where the goalie's on his belly and the player goes to elevate the puck and they yeah. lift their right leg, you know, yeah, yeah. like their back leg. They just lift their foot like it was in the net. And he... And he got robbed. So that's two games, two grade A chances. He zipped around. He's not a big guy. No. I mean, I don't know him well enough. I saw him at the juniors uh, and was uh, a few years ago and was quite impressed with his tenacity. But he's, you know, he's he's got 15 goals in 30 games in the American League. And this is the next step. You get a few games here. And, and then, you know, you go back and you continue to build your game. I just thought Daryl could have handled that a hundred different ways other than the way he did. Yeah. And that's probably as close to the acknowledgement of I screwed this up, maybe even leaning towards an apology <laughs> as you're ever going to get right. publicly from Daryl Sutter in that environment. So those are your headlines, right? Thanks again to uh, our good friends at Boston pizza. 